my pleasure to introduce Tobias Dickhoff, who will give a talk on curved sheaves and shoulders on radial surfaces. So, yeah, please. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give this lecture. So first of all, if you have a question, you can just ask it right away. Turn your microphone, because otherwise you have the feeling I'm talking to myself and it's kind of, yeah, so I think that's okay. So, um, so um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some joint work in progress um, with um, Mikhail Kapranov, Vadim Schechtman and Jan Seubelmann. We've been working on this for uh, quite a while now, and I think we're finally approaching something reasonable. So that's what I'd like to tell you about. And then also there's some independent contributions by Merlin Christ, which I will discuss towards the end of the talk. So, and so here, here's our plan. So we're trying to um, first um, give a sort of new perspective on constructible sheaves and perverse sheaves on Riemann surfaces. So in the simplest kind of situation, maybe which is uh, interesting. And then in the second part, we're going to categorify perverse sheaves, defining what are called perverse shoulders. And in the third part, um, we're going to discuss what we can do with the resulting theory. So that's the plan. So let's get started. Um, so, so here's, um, let's get started with the first part about constructible sheaves and perverse sheaves. So here's the setup. Um, we're looking at a Riemann surface, but really, you know, what matters is the underlying topological space and maybe later the orientation. The Riemann surface could have some boundary, which I expressed by these little circles here, which are missing. Um, and it could also be open, that's all totally fine. <clears throat> and um, then there's a bunch of special points, which will, for the remainder of the talk, <clears throat> always be called N and will be depicted by uh, these yellow stars. Okay, and so what's, um, what we, derived from these special points is a stratification of the surface, which is just the decomposition into exactly the union of those points, which is N and their open complement. Okay, so that's a stratification. And um, with respect to this stratification, we would like to study the derived constructible category with values in some abelian category. Okay, so what is that? That's just the derived category of complexes of sheaves on the surface such that the cohomology sheaves are um, locally constant um, in the complement of the special points. Okay, so in other words, the cohomology sheaves are just local systems. They're given, for example, by a representation of the fundamental group of the complement. Okay, and so now we would like to explore um, certain additional structure that I can put on this derived um, constructible category. Okay, and so. This structure was um, introduced, um, studied in much greater generality, of course, um, in the um, famous work of uh, Balinson, Bernstein, and Dillin. So that's um, the classical reference BBD, where they introduced and uh, studied perverse sheaves and proved um, many things about them. So, so and the, the interesting phenomenon, um, or starting point um, of, of this work is, uh, is the notion of a recolement. So that's um, <clears throat> that's basically um, just a way to um, describe um, one category as uh, sort of an extension of two smaller subcategories. In our situation, the category which we're interested in is this derived constructible category here in the center, and then the pieces into which it decomposes is the derived category of um, N itself, So because N is discrete, that's just a bunch of copies of the derived category of A. And um, then there's um, the derived constructible category of the complement of N, but um, because here we don't specify any points, we have removed the special points. These are just derived local systems. So it's just complexes of sheaves where each um, cohomology sheaf is a local system. Okay. And then there's a so-called um Won't matter at this point so much um, what exactly it is. I just have various functors that are relating these categories. And so these, which are written on top of one another, they're gonna be adjoint to one another here and here. So for example, here, the middle one will be extension by zero, and this middle one will be restriction to the complement. so that if you walk uh, along any consecutive lines that are on the same horizontal level, the composite will be zero. Anyway, so what, what BBD notice in this context is that it's um, possible 
to produce a T structure on this um, middle piece of any such a recalement just by specifying a T structure on each of the pieces from which uh, you think um, it is being um, composed. Okay. And so now we can do the following. Um, we just look at the standard T structures to begin with. And then we shift the standard T structure on this derived local system parts um, either by zero, so it means we don't do anything, or by one or by two. And then the theorem of BBB tells me that there's a canonical T structure on the middle piece, which are obtained by gluing these T structures together. Okay. So each of these T structures then has a heart, which is an abelian category. And um, they're denoted here by heart zero, heart one, and heart two. So these are three abelian categories that sit inside this derived constructible category. And the first thing we would like to understand is how to describe these abelian categories as concretely as possible. Okay, so if, if much of that somehow um, doesn't mean much to you, T structures and so on, don't worry, we're now going to give a, a sort of um, independent description of these three abelian categories. And that's essentially sort of all we care about. I just wanted to give you <clears throat> the context in which they historically um, were defined. Okay. And so specifically, um, the category that we will care most about is this middle piece here, which is um, what is called the category of perverse sheets. Okay, so that's um, the starting point. And um, now um, we will try to understand these abelian categories. And so the first thing we would like to understand is the following question. It's like, if I hand to you an object of this derived constructible category, how can you tell whether this object um, lies in the heart of one of these T structures, okay? So we would like to have a nice criterion, a recognition cr a criterion that tells us um, that this object lies in one of these, okay? So BBD, um, within this general context, they give us a criterion, but um, we will aim at actually a slightly um, different criterion, which we'll now discuss, okay? And so um, what the discussion, what this um, recognition criterion will be based on is a notion of relative cohomology. So if I have F, so this is an object in this derived constructible category, um, then what I can do is I can look at a pair of sub, um, subsets of X, um, A prime and A, and I can define the relative cohomology. So what is that? I just look at the restriction map on derived sections with values in F. So that's exactly this map here. And then I take, uh, if you want the, the homotopy fiber or in this context now, it's actually totally fine to think of triangulated categories. So then I just take the cone of this restriction map and then I shift it back um, by minus one so that I have a distinguished triangle in the derived category of A, which has exactly the form um, that is depicted here. Okay, and then this piece here of this distinguished triangle, that's the relative cohomology, which we're going to be interested in, okay? And now it turns out that you can measure, you can test whether um, such an object F is in the hearts uh, of one of these T structures um, by a certain property of this um, relative cohomology with respect to carefully chosen pairs A and A prime, okay? So, and this is how this goes. So, um, and, and this is a totally elementary computation. If you unravel the definition of the T structures here, then this is essentially a rather, a rather uh, more or less immediate consequence. So, so what we see is that F is in the heart of, in the heart I, in one of these T structures, if and only if this relative cohomology for the pair A, A prime is pure in degree zero. So that means, right, a priori, um, this guy here is an object in the derived category of A, and pure in degree zero just means that it's actually just quasi-isomorphic to a single object concentrated in degree zero. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say element of A contained in D of A. Okay, so it's pure in degree zero for all pairs A comma A prime of a certain form. And now the pair A A prime will be different, of course, um, for each of these T structures. So the first kind of pair, um, it's pretty, um, that's a pretty obvious statement here. I'm just choosing the pair A comma empty 
where A will now always be a closed disk. Okay, so I have a closed disk, and this disk is contained in X, so somewhere here in the surface. Um, and the requirement throughout from now on is that whenever we have a disk somewhere in the surface, then um, it, it is only allowed to contain at most one special point um, or no special point, but no more. So either no special point or a single special point. So that's um, what this bracket um, yellow star means, either one or either none. So, okay, and then what are we computing here then? If this is just a disk, um, we place this somewhere. Well, because this um, this um, this uh, object F was a local system outside of the punctures, for example, outside of the special points. Let's say we replace the disk somewhere here on the surface. Then this guy here will just compute the stock. Actually, it'll just compute the stock, um, essentially of any point in this disk here of this object F. Okay, and so what we're saying is we have a complex of sheaves. And um, this complex of sheaves is concentrated in degree zero. That's just what it means to be the standard uh, in the heart of the standard T structure, if and only if all the stocks are cohomologically concentrated in degree zero. Okay, so this is kind of just um, pre immediately clear from the from the setup that um, standard T structure I can check by checking these um, the so to say the stocks with respect to these standard disks. Okay, and now it turns out that um, there is, in some sense, a similar notion of a stock in the sense that I compute this um, relative cohomology of a disk with a certain decoration on its boundary, relative to a certain decoration on its boundary. And um, so, for example, in the for the second T structure, what I should do is I should compute the relative cohomology of A relative to the boundary circle in this case. Yeah? So, and I can tell whether an object F is in the heart um, of this um, second T structure, if and only if the value I get by computing this relative cohomology is pure in degree zero. Okay, so if so, I won't do this computation for time reasons, but it's, for example, a, a nice and simple computation, which you can immediately check, is if you, uh, if you compute this kind of relative cohomology um, applied to a local system, so just um, you know something which is constant um, somewhere outside here, then the effect of computing this relative cohomology is just to shift the object um, by minus two. So therefore, you see here we have produced this T structure by shifting by two. This relative cohomology shifts back by minus two, so that puts it back into degree zero. So that's some kind of a sanity check. Okay, but then. The interesting statement is that it also holds if it contains a special point. And then it's, you know, just a, a little computation. And then maybe the most interesting part is um, that also this um, middle T structure, these perverse sheaves, it can actually be detected by computing this relative cohomology. Um, but now I take a disk and then there's going to be some finite um, collection of closed intervals, let's say, doesn't really matter if they're closed or open, but we choose them to be closed on the boundary of um, this disk. So any finite number, you compute this relative cohomology, and it turns out that's how you can check whether an object F is in this um, in the heart of this perverse T structure. Okay, so somehow the situation can be thought of um, like that. Like so, each of these T structures, it has a favorite kind of stock. Um, which you're supposed to use um, to understand objects that um, lie in the heart. For um, the standard T structure, you're supposed to use a standard stock, which is the cohomology or sections on this disk. For um, this second T structure, you're supposed to use this, um, you know, basically what this is computing here is sections with compact support. So you're supposed to use this sections with compact support stock. And then for this middle T structure, it's again, some kind of adapted stock which will spit out something um, just abelian, pure in degree zero, if you apply it to something that is in the heart of this um, respective T structure, okay? So that's the first observation. So there's a, a neat, um, if you want geometrically appealing way to um, somehow test whether um, an object in the derived constructible category is in, one of, in the hearts of one of these T structures by computing this um, sort of generalized adapted um, notion of stock. Okay, so that was step number one. And now 
we'd like to move to step number two, which is the question, okay. Um, Sorry, can maybe, I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so the, this middle one, uh, this Milner disks, uh, so if, uh, if the base was not uh, two dimensional, higher dimensional, what would be the analog in there? I don't know actually. So there, yeah, so, so I think, I mean, so we both maybe know uh, some special cases um, for, for what one could do. Um, to actually um, understand this, but in the higher dimensional case, um, there's so far no, so, so there's of course um, statements um, of the same kind where I somehow choose, for example, a half plane, a half plane contained in a whole plane. So that's um, one that works for a certain kind of, um, for example, hyperplane um, configurations and trying to understand perverse sheaves on those, but sort of in general, um, there's not really like a good um, theory with, in higher dimensions, which is as systematic as the one that I'm about to explain. Yeah, so, okay. so there are statements of this kind, but um, it, it won't be um, possible to develop it as systematically. At, at least we don't know yet. So that's maybe a future, like a, a very long-term future goal is to have um, a theory of perverse sheaves based on precisely these ideas in all dimensions. Um, okay. But yeah, we can discuss this maybe in some more detail um, uh, later on. So yeah, so now what we're trying to understand next is we're gonna get more ambitious. We have found a way to test whether an object is in this T structure by computing this kind of a, um, generalized stock, so to say. Now we'd like to understand, can we maybe describe the whole heart as an abelian category in terms of um, precisely these stocks, okay? So in other words, what we should then understand is how are stocks or like relative cohomologies for different disks related to one another. So in other words, what is the factoriality of the construction that that takes relative cohomology with values in a fixed sheaf F? Okay, so that's the next slide, which looks a bit intimidating, so don't get scared. We will unravel this um, step by step. Um, it's somehow simpler than, than it maybe looks on first sight. Okay, so this is the question we're now trying to answer. What's the functoriality of this construction here? <clears throat> and so what we're gonna describe is we're gonna describe a certain category, which has more or less these disks here as objects. And then we're gonna describe certain morphisms between these disks on the surface, so that whenever I have a morphism in the sense we will define, then I get a map in the opposite direction. Um, um, so a pullback map on relative cohomology, okay? And so um, how are we gonna do this? Well, so what's gonna happen is that these disks, um, they will start moving around on the surface. So that's, so a morphism will basically move the disk um, around on the surface. And then while it's moving around, um, it's sort of going to interact in a, in a prescribed way with um, the special points. Um, and also, sort of interesting things can happen to the intervals um, on the, that are on the boundary of this disk while it's moving around, okay? And so here's how we set this up. So to let the disk move around, we will choose a parameterization. So we will now switch from disks to parameterized disks. So here D, this bold face D is um, going to be a closed uh, unit disk, uh, let's say in the complex numbers. And then the objects of the category we're now describing are parameterized disks. So they're embeddings of this closed disk into X. A prime in the boundary of this disk will be a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, intervals or empty or the full circle, okay? And so now, for example, what are we doing here? Now, moving around the disk means we choose an isotopy. And the isotopy is given by mapping such a cylinder I times D into the surface. That's what this map H here is. And then, um, you know, I'm moving along this isotopy from one end of the cylinder to the other end of the cylinder. And that's how I'm gonna describe morphisms. So for example, here's a picture of a, of a morphism. Um, what's happening here? Well, the, this cylinder has an additional decoration, which are the, it's a configuration of these pairs of pants that end in these um, chosen boundary intervals here. And then what you see in yellow is the inverse image of um, the special points, okay? So it's the trajectories, so to say, of the special points um, as I pull them back onto the cylinder. So, okay, so, so you look at the cylinder and so the disc is moving along the surface um, 
parameterized by moving through the cylinder from the left to the right. Yeah. So and so then, therefore, each vertical slice gives you um, uh, the position. The image of each vertical slice in X gives you the position of the disk um, at a certain time. So so therefore, let's now um, try to understand um, what's um, what's happening here. Um, maybe. Yeah. So let's let's take one of these disks. For example, this guy here. I don't know that. So, okay, so we start here and then now um, we're moving this disk. Okay, so I'm describing what's happening um, in this morphism here, sort of time slice by time slice. The disk moves towards the special point and then at some point the special point enters. Suck. Okay, so that's the point of entry. That's always going to be denoted by this little yellow circle. That's the entry point of a special point. And notice that this entry point, it lies in the white part of this of the boundary of the cylinder and not in the green part. Now it keeps moving, okay? So that was um, this position here, which we have just described. Now it keeps moving, oops, uh, keeps moving. Sorry, um, Yeah? Uh, I just had a question. Uh, are the slides available for uh, if people want to have a look at them? Uh, so yeah, I'll post them later. So yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So here. So now here we're in, at this location here, where the special point is actually contained inside the disk, and then something, um, another sort of interesting move happens. Namely, these two intervals they merge into a single interval. So let's pull the disk away and draw this. Okay. So here is now somehow these two get merged, get sub subsumed by a single interval. Okay. And now we're like that. So that was what was happening here at this location. And then um, we keep moving the disk. Now it's moving out again. Oops, that's well, different. Oh no, something strange happened. Uh, oops, okay, that was a, no, some bug happened. <laughs> okay, so now the interval has become larger and now the disk is allowed to move back out of the special point. And notice that the exit point which is the point with the cross, is at a green part of the boundary. Okay, now it keeps moving. And here's another entry point. So that could mean, for example, that the disk um, moves in here, again, through the part which is not green, but it's a complement of the green boundary configuration. And then ultimately a new um, interval is emerging on this disk. So something like that. Okay, so this could be a trajectory of a disk, which is depicted by precisely this isotopy. Okay, so what are we saying? Um, we're describing here a certain category um, which, um, according to which, um, follows certain rules. Um, let's see if I can erase this again. Yeah, so follows certain rules. Um, um, let me see. Just want to have this guy again. Okay, and so what are the rules it follows? The disks are allowed to move around um, in the complement of the special points. They're allowed to move over a special point as long as the entry point is in the complement of the green part of the boundary. They're allowed to exit as long as um, the exit point is in the green intervals. And um, that's the behavior I have. So it's some kind of a hybrid exit entry behavior that has to do with the boundary configuration of these disks, okay? And that's precisely described um, by um, this category um, according to, to, to certain rules of exit and entry behavior, right? So the morphisms given by drawing the cylinder, specifying the isotopy, and then specifying the pairs of um, pants uh, configuration on its, um, on its boundary with the extra um, requirement that all the entry points of the special points have to be in the complement of the of the pants um, that are in, that are um, depicted green, and the exit points have to be in the green part. And then there's certain relations that um, that um, identify some of these. So there's an, a homotopy between these isotopies, and by that I mod out by. So in the end, I get an ordinary category um, that um, has its objects all of these um, embedded disks. So it has standard disks, Milner disks, and bounded disks. And there's a certain 
um, interesting class of morphisms between them. Okay. And now you see, if I put exactly these requirements, and if I also assume that the pair of the pairs of pants or the bordisms that are um, embedded into the boundary of the cylinder, they are actually homotopy equivalent to the boundary configuration at the target, then it's another computation that the relative cohomology, um, on relative cohomology, I will then get an isomorphism, a quasi-isomorphism. Okay, so so that's how this is designed. So what does that mean? That means whenever you write on such a morphism, you get a map on derived sections in the other direction, okay? Just by inverting this isomorphism and then going like here. Okay, so in other words, um, this category, so the category which arises like this is what we call the extended paracyclic category of the surface. And that category is precisely what um, captures at least a certain amount of functoriality among all these relative cohomologies um, um, for a fixed um, for a fixed object f, okay? And so now this category has certain interesting subcategories. Um, so for example, it has um, the subcategory that is um, that is spanned by these um, standard disks here. And that's a very familiar category. Let's um, investigate that one more time. So that's just given by the standard disk. The disks are allowed to move around. Right, so that basically gives me just a copy of the fundamental group weight of the complement. And then it's allowed to move across the special point um, because it doesn't have any green configuration, but now it cannot leave because there is nothing green on its boundary. If it wanted to leave, then the exit point had to be uh, uh, in the green part of the boundary configuration, but so it's stuck here. Okay, that's what the entrance path, it's the entrance path category. So um, it's a it's a hybrid, it's an extension, so to say, of the fundamental group weight of the complement, where I also allow certain one-way roads that go to lower dimensional strata, but they cannot come back, okay? So therefore the full category spent by these standard disks is actually, what is this entrance path category? It's a very simple category to describe. And then interestingly, this other category, it's exactly the opposite. So I can also, of course, move around this disk in the complement of the special points, but now it's the other way around. I can start with the disk containing the point and then it can exit, but now it cannot come back. So that's um, what is called the exit path category. At least it's equivalent um, to the exit path category. That's how this is set up. And then in between, there's this, um, there's this mysterious piece. Um, there's this mysterious piece, which is um, given by these um, Milner pairs, Milner disks, and they kind of don't know um, what they want. So they can both actually enter um, across a special point and they can also exit again, okay? And so forth. And then there's some relations, as I said, which I'm kind of um, hiding under the table. All right. And so now um, I guess the strategy is maybe clear. Now we piece together these two observations. On the one hand, we have understood um, the purity phenomenon so um, that we can measure whether um, an, a sheaf is in one of these, in the heart of one of these T structures by computing relative cohomology. And now we also understand a certain amount of functoriality um, between these relative cohomologies. Okay, so and now this is what we're gonna utilize um, like that. So here's how this piece is together. It means, uh, so what's written here, here I have the hearts of these three T structures that we have produced. Um, so for the first one, I, you know, I just compute um, relative cohomology and then I restrict to standard disks. And as we have seen, I have, I, I then therefore get a functor um, using exactly this functoriality of this category, um, opposite because the functoriality is contravariant and it's valued in A itself. That's because of the purity. Not in, usually a priori it would land in the derived category of A, but now it's actually in A, okay? And so what we recover here is actually an equivalence of categories, which describes um, the abelian category of constructible sheaves on the surface as representations of the exit path category. And that's was proven in much greater generality, I think for the first time by, um, by um, Toyman, um, who also actually described a two categorical version of that statement for, um, for stacks, okay? So this is like a simple instance of this general result of uh, Troyman describing um, constructible sheaves in, a, in, a, in, in general as representations of, um, of a version of this exit path category um, for arbitrarily stratified spaces, okay?
Now here, this is essentially a, just an immediate consequence of Verdi duality combined with uh, with the Toyman res result. Um, we get that the heart of this um, second T structure here, it, it is actually representations on these bounded disks. Okay. And sort of what you notice here is actually that the entrance path category and the exit path category, you know, just from the description I have given, they're actually opposite to one another. And so what you learn from this is that, okay, so if this is the category of constructible sheaves, and then you look at this guy here and I just apply up inside the argument, then you will see that the category hard two is actually equivalent to functors um, from the exit path category in A up. So in other words, that tells you that um, hard two is actually just the abelian category of, co of constructible Cauchy's. So that's kind of one funny um, uh, first observation is that the derived category of constructible sheaves, it contains both the abelian category of sheaves and the abelian category of co-sheaves, but sort of embedded into different places, okay? And then there's also this middle piece, um, and that's now our theorem, that there's also an equivalence between these perverse sheaves, and you can characterize them as representations of this um, category spanned by the Milner disks, which we call the paracyclic category. There's just one difference here is that here, you know, there's so many, there's uh, too many Milner disks. So it's clear that the stocks, um, you know, will have some relations um, and those relations you have to understand. They of course come from some descent conditions because after all they were sheaves. So they satisfy descent with respect to open covers. And that's um, what we will have to keep track of. So that's what the sharp means. So here's the, here's the theorem. So this, this um, functor of taking um, relative cohomology provides an equivalence between perverse sheaves and what we call Milner sheaves, while a Milner sheaf is just, um, is just a, a pre-sheaf on, um, on this paracyclic category that satisfies um, conditions. The first condition is a normalization condition, the relative cohomology of, a, of such a Milner disk with one interval that doesn't contain a special point that is actually just zero. That's pretty clear, that's, that's, um, that holds. And then there's a descent condition, which tells me that if I take such a Milner disk and I cut it into two pieces, um, then I get a pullback diagram, which is bit <coughs> just like, you know, think of it as Maya via Taurus with basically some open cover and its intersection. Okay, so, and, um, and that's it. So, so in other words, what we have achieved is um, somehow, it's a purely abelian description of these three abelian categories without any reference to the ambient derived category in which they originally arose, right? So this is a sort of a very elementary thing. You don't have to understand anything about derived categories to understand this definition. Um, the complication of course is somehow that there's these, you know, that the, the, this category, the parasitic category is um, sort of slightly subtle to understand. Okay, so let's get a little hands-on and just, you know, try to do some computations. So, um, I know before we get hands-on, I wanted to describe one nice feature, which has to be discussed at this point. And that's the observation that um, this extended paracyclic category is actually self-dual. It has a self-duality, so an equivalence between it and its opposite. And how is it given? It's given by starting with a disk with a certain boundary configuration and replacing that boundary configuration by the complementary boundary configuration. So if you have a Milner disk, you know, it act, you get, actually get an object which is isomorphic to the original one, but somehow not canonically. While if you, if you apply this to a standard disk, you get a bounded disk and vice versa. If you apply it to a bounded disk, you get a standard disk. So this duality on the paracyclic category, it actually swaps standard disks and bounded disks, but it preserves Milner disks, okay? And so why is this a self-duality? And that's sort of neatly visible just directly from the definition of these um, morphisms. Namely, if you look at this picture and you replace um, each boundary configurations on the source and target by their complement, and you also replace um, the pansportisms um, embedded in the cylinder by their complement, that means you replace the green part by the white complement, then you will see if you read this picture from right to left, then you get precisely an allowed morphism um, in the other direction, right? Because so you see the white part here is, for example, a pair of pants from this guy and this guy moving over here. 
Also, because now you read backwards in time, exit and entry points become interchanged. And so you see that it all works out really neatly. Okay. So, so this is sort of one uh, feature which by design was supposed to happen in this parasitic category, is self-duality. Why is this supposed to happen? Well, because now <clears throat> this has an interesting consequence, and that's that it provides a very elementary description um, of Verdi duality. Okay. And so notice that notice that you know sheaves and co-sheaves with values in the fixed abelian categories, they're not equivalent typically. Okay, at, at least in some sort of degenerate situations, sheaves and co-sheaves will not be equivalent as abelian categories. Um, and so, you know, that's just somehow because these categories, um, they're somehow opposites of one another, but they're not somehow self-opposite or something like that. But now, the paracyclic category is self-opposite, and that has a nice phenomenon. Namely, I can now do, um, I can now take such a Milner sheave, I can apply this duality, and then I take up again, and then I get a Milner co-sheave. And so the interesting phenomenon is that there is sort of a hidden co-descent condition, which holds additionally to this descent condition, which makes this map here really um, well-defined, right? So it's not, it's clear that I get this on the level of pre-sheaves, but then it has to descend to this sheaf condition. And that's sort of something I have to check. And that's an interesting phenomenon which is sort of one of the features of perverse sheaves that with, with the duality, it, it somehow, it, it preserves them. Or in our language now, um, a perverse sheaf, it sort of doesn't really know what it wants to be. It doesn't know what if it wants to be a sheaf or a co-sheaf. And so the conclusion is that it's both. Okay, so via this equivalence, I can think of any Milner sheaf as also a co-sheaf. And so that's um, somehow sure. like a... a a curious um, phenomenon in this video. Sorry, is it possible yeah. to is it possible to make a, a historical remark about why this is called Milner? Uh, I, yeah, actually, let me not um, make it. So, I mean, it's our terminology, and so it's it's just related to the to you know, it's basically you can think of it as some Milner fiber of the function um, z to the n plus one. Oh, okay. me, yeah, it's a bit distracting. It's not relevant at this point. Okay. It, yeah, it has to do with, um, you know, there's a notion of vanishing cycle um, uh, stock, basically, for any function. If, and if you do it for z to the n plus 1, um, then that's precisely what you get. And then this somehow relates to, to in, in a sort of very elementary and direct way, it relates to a certain kind of Milner fiber. Okay. And so right. that's that's uh, what it's um, motivated by. Yeah. But, you know, for now, just take it as a name. It's This interpretation is not um, going to be relevant. Okay. So... Yes. Uh, in the in your picture of the cylinder, could you maybe? I'm a bit confused there. Uh, so this second exit point, it's not in the in the green area. Um, ah, sorry, no, that wasn't an exit point, but that's a star, and that star is still inside the disk. So yeah, sorry, that's a bit. Ah, I should okay, have okay, made okay, that so more clear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's not an exit point because it's still in the disk here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, yeah, so please ask um, uh, ask many questions. So, um, okay, so now here's a little hands-on computation, which is probably what every one of you um, would have done if I had given you this definition. You know, you, you just try to start playing around with, okay, what what is this really? Like, how can I write down, like, such a Milner sheaf? Um, so this is probably the computation you would have done. You first of all look at the simplest kind of surface or just a little local piece of the surface around such a special point and you try to understand what's going on there okay so and so the normalization condition tells you that the value in any such a disk is just zero <clears throat> then the next interesting disk is maybe a disk with two boundary intervals so you know and now that just let's say we take the abelian category of vector spaces so that's just going to be a vector space v okay and then there is some interesting stuff I can do. For example, I can rotate this disk with two intervals by 180 degrees. That's a morphism. So the question is, what will that do? Okay, and so surprisingly, that's already a little tricky to sort out. Um, it turns out that this is actually forced by the descent conditions to be multiplication by minus one. So let me not discuss this um, um, any further here. And there's a more interesting one, which is obtained by taking this disk and moving it around the special point, 
that's going to give me an automorphism. And that's called TV here. That's um, you know, some kind of monodromy of the sky moving around the singularity. OK, then I have this other stock, this other Milner stock, which is now a disk with a single interval, but containing a special point. So that's not normalized to 0. So it's going to be another vector space, v, a w. OK, again, now this has a different kind of monodromy, because I can now take this disk and rotate it by 360 degrees. That's this plus pi here, plus 2 pi here. <clears throat> and that's um, another automorphism, which I call tw. Then there's a way to relate them. Here I drew this morphism, um, which is basically a version of what we have discussed previously. It's this disk here <coughs> moving over the special point through, let's say, this um, this um, white part of the boundary. And then just after this has moved in, the, the gate is kind of closed after it has um, moved across, right? So that's what this pair of pants here does. It kind of closes these two intervals after the point has um, entered um, together to a single one. So that's the morphism from here to here. Let's call it F. And then I can just apply the duality. So I, from this picture here, I get a dual picture. And that produces another morphism in the other direction. Um, so let's call this G. Sorry, I think I'm mixing covariant and contravariant front reality, but it's because itself, obviously, it doesn't really matter. So anyway, so that's some data, some kind of immediate data that I extract um, from any Milner sheaf um, by just you know looking at what's happening for these kinds of um, Milner disks um, around such a special point. So now um, let's try to understand whether there's some relations that these th this data has to satisfy. Okay, and so that's the following. Now I take a disk, the next sort of um, biggest disk is like two intervals, but it contains a special point, okay? Now that the value on that disk <coughs> is completely determined um, by this data here, because I can cut the disk into two pieces. One disk on the left-hand side will be just this Milner disk here, and the other disk on the right-hand side will be this guy. So it's just a sum V plus W. That's what the descent condition um, tells me. Yeah? So that's descent. I can cut pieces. Now, I can start rotating the disk and see what happens. Okay, so I can rotate it by 360 degrees and rotation by 360 degrees, it preserves this cut. So therefore, the corresponding um, automorphism preserves the direct sum decomposition. Okay, so I get such a diagonal matrix. And then if you unravel what's actually happening, you can, uh, you can see that the both components are actually precisely the two monodromies um, that we have um, extracted above. Okay. Um, okay, but then there's also another thing I can do, which is to rotate by 180 degree. And that rotation, it does not preserve the cut. It moves the cut to a different cut. And that gives me an a priori different direct sum decomposition. And then I have to translate from that different decomposition to the one I have chosen previously. And that's a bit of a kind of fiddly computation. So you do it and you realize that in terms of the original decomposition, the matrix looks precisely like that. So again, you can describe it in terms of the data which we've extracted above, but it's sort of, you know, it's it's not completely um, obvious. But then that means that there's a condition because of course, if I rotate by pi and then again by pi, I rotate by two pi. So that means the square of this matrix is this matrix. And that's precisely these relations, these beautiful relations. The monodromy is given as the identity minus, um, minus first applying F and then G, and the monodromy here is given by first applying G and then applying F and taking the difference to the identity. Okay, so, and it turns out that this linear algebraic data here, um, it actually um, completely describes the category of perverse sheaves um, in the situation where I only have a disk with one special point. So in other words, there's an equivalence of categories which is classically known between perverse sheaves on the disk with one special point and exactly this linear algebraic data. Okay, and so now you can ask, okay, why did we have to do this complicated thing with these Milner disks then that's like, like uh, so much more complicated than just this uh, simple diagram? And the answer is somehow sort of, of uh, twofold. One is this data, it depends on certain choices. It depends from which direction you have chosen to approach the special point, um, you know, and sort of have you chosen to to um, to sort of rotate the disks or not rotate the disks? So it depends on certain choices, and um, this description in terms of Milner sheaves is um, intrinsic 
it's independent of any choices. And that's like a conceptual advantage. Also, in the categorified um, computations, um, we would like to have access to the values of a Milner sheaf on these higher Milner stocks with more intervals anyway. So it's good to um, just incorporate them right from the beginning. Okay, so that's um, kind of this story. So we end up with a, you know, maybe it's a little complicated, this parameterizing category, but it's sort of a very elementary description of this abelian category of perverse sheaves. Now, um, we would like to categorify it. What does this mean? We will now um, define the concept of a perverse Schober, which is supposed to be a categorified perverse sheaf in the sense that um, I'm replacing, let's say, the category of abelian groups um, with the category of um, whatever your preferred choice is, either stable infinity categories or, let's say, triangulated DG categories or triangulated A infinity categories. And the way to produce an abelian group, so the way to decategorify is to just compute the golden D group. Okay. So we would like to now perform constructions on this categorified level of stable infinity categories such that if we decategorify by applying K0, at least to, to a certain amount, then we recover the sort of um, classical story of perverse sheaves. Um, th that's some of the idea. So th therefore, instead of looking at Milner sheaves valued in abelian groups, we now look at Milner sheaves valued in the infinity category of, um, let's say, stable infinity categories. But it's good to have these different models here in mind um, the first one sort of gives me the most um, foundational flexibility um, just because um, I, I guess maybe Jacob Lurie has put a lot of work in developing this machinery. So there's many, many um, um, very nice tools that you can use um, to, to understand the situation. And these um, are, are also very useful because they provide you with explicit models um, in case you ever want to really explicitly compute something. We will see this um, later on. It's uh, very um, important, for example, to have a model structure on DG categories. Um, anyway, so and so that's the target. Um, um, and now, you know, we're just basically imitating the definition of a perverse sheaf, but um, in this kind of a little more fancy context. So the question is then, how do we formulate these um, conditions? And so here's how it goes. We have a first condition, which is obvious. It's a, a normalization condition. This, this um, goes to the zero category. Then we have a descent condition. As a little caveat here is that the descent now only holds for cuts which um, begin and end in a boundary interval. So this cut here, for example, is now not allowed anymore. And then we have descent and also the dual co-descent. As a replacement for the fact that we don't have um, descent for a cut which ends um, away from the intervals, we have recolement. So you see here in this situation, um, if we have a cut which ends away from an interval, then we got a direct sum decomposition. In this context, we don't really get a direct sum decomposition of these two pieces, but we get a recolement. So in other words, this guy here is glued together non-trivially from this piece and this piece, such that after passing the golden dick groups, um, I actually do just get the direct sum of golden dick groups. Right? So that's something which could happen now in this categorified level something is glued together non-trivially in a twisted way, um, and it still produces the same direct sum after, after taking K0. Okay, so now I just wanted to do exactly the same kind of computation in this context, um, which we have done for perverse sheaves, um, but now for perverse shoulders. Okay, so to a large extent, to a large extent, it's actually kind of the same. You know, this disk here goes to the zero category, this disk here goes to some chosen um, uh, stable infinity category. This one goes to stable infinity category. Um, the first interesting statement is, is maybe what happens rotation to 180 degree that goes to the suspension functor. Then there's two functors, F and G. Okay, now a new phenomenon would happen, which happens in this situation is that these functors are actually adjoint to one another. So there's one functor F, and then let's say it has a right adjoint G. Um, that's a general phenomenon that dual morphisms um, in this um, in this context actually get mapped to adjoint functors. And now the most interesting part here is what happens to this descent condition, because um, that now we expect to be weakened by the statement that we have this recolement. Okay, and that's when you start to really um, begin to um, observe the beauty um, 
of the story is that um, even though we have this recommend here, um, this um, computation here, it really categorifies in a very interesting way. So how does it go? Instead of having a direct sum of A and B, that's what we would have had for the perverse sheaves, we now have this recommend or semi-orthogonal decomposition, um, which comes equipped with a gluing functor. And the gluing functor is, well, what else could it be? It's either F or it's adjoint G, which means that um, this category can be described as the category of, so an object in this category can be specified by specif specifying an object A in A, an object B in B, together with the gluing data, which is a map from A to G of B, or equivalently, I can pass to the adjoint map, which is a map from F of A to B. Okay, now give, so this data describes uniquely an object here. And so now I'm gonna describe an, this auto equivalence on the level of objects. And what does it do? <laughs> it produces a new um, triple of this data. So I need first an object in A, what is it? It's the cone of the map from A to G of B, which is the gluing data, okay? Notice that on the level of K0, this is just going to be G of B minus A, which is precisely what this matrix here gives me. Okay. Similarly, I now pass to the adjoint map and I take the cone of the adjoint map, which is F of A to B. Okay. Again, this is B minus F of A, and that's also precisely what this other matrix um, gives me after categorifying. And um, so that's, if you want the description of exactly this um, odd equivalence, which is given by rotating by 180 degrees. Again, it has to be compatible with the full rotation. And that then gives me some extra condition, which is the following beautiful um, condition. It's that this odd equivalence TA is actually the cone of the unit map of the adjunction up to shift. And this odd equivalence T of B is the cone of the co-unit map. Um, and so this is um, a concept which, which was introduced um, originally by Reno Anno, um, which is what is called a spherical adjunction. Okay. So this is, in other words, how a perverse Schober is supposed to look like locally. Um, we expect actually eventually, if the theory is um, sort of um, spelled out um, um, appropriately, that there's a theorem that tells me that um, every such a perverse Schober is actually locally um, precisely equivalent to the datum of, given, uh, of giving such a spherical adjunction. But again, the advantage is that it's coordinate free. It's an intrinsic definition and it doesn't depend on any choices. Okay, so, um, so what do we really have? We don't quite yet have um, that spherical adjunctions are actually equivalent to perverse Schobers locally, but we do have a construction which from a spherical adjunction produces a perverse Schober. And that's maybe good enough to get started. Um, so this is, sort of a, actually requires quite some work. So that's a whole paper of like 50 pages um, just to construct this. And it's called the spherical S construction. And it really forces you to understand very systematically the concept of an adjunction and sort of various relations which you have for spherical adjunctions in the context of stable infinity categories. Our conjecture is that it's actually an equivalence just like in the decategorified situation. Remark maybe is that there is an alternative approach to this whole story which actually uses two categorical structure of stable infinity categories. Um, and, you know, in this world, it's kind of clear that there's a rather, um, rather, um, it's clear that there's a strategy for how to proving that this is an equivalence. And so that's why our research group has put in quite a bit of effort recently in trying to develop the necessary foundations, which, which are somehow not um, established um, to the level that we would need them to really work with them comfortably. But so that's uh, maybe just a side remark. And so now let's just focus on this situation. From a spherical adjunction, we can locally um, produce such a perverse Schober in the sense we defined. And then we can also glue these local perverse Schobers um, to more global objects. And that's some, um, you know, all these exit path categories, um, they, and also the fundamental group void, of course, they satisf satisfy versions of the von Kampen theorem. So for example, Jacob Lurie has established actually very general um, infinity categorical versions um, of those Van Kampen uh, formulas. So here um, we just have a very sort of um, down to earth um, computation. So um, which describes actually the, the paracyclic category of the gluing of two disks along another disk, which doesn't contain any special points as, um, as a homotopy pushout. And so that of course now um, allows me 
to glue perverse showbers by somehow providing a perverse shoulder on, on, on Y1, one on Y2, and then telling how to glue them on the overlap. And that's somehow something which can easily be done in concrete um, examples. OK, and so now um, we would like to um, see what we can do with this concept. So um, what should we do with perverse showbers? OK. And so, um, yeah, so, so the thing which we're currently trying to do is to compute certain versions of Fukaya categories, which you could call Fukaya categories with coefficients. OK, so what I mean by that, so we have seen um, throughout this workshop several constructions which somebody described the Fukaya category in various incarnations um, of, of the Riemann surface um, as um, being glued together um, by from copies of the AN quiver. And so um, what we're sort of, the, the statement we're making here is that this computation, it can be interpreted as computing some sort of relative cohomology of the surface with constant coefficients, okay? So now here, we're going to compute relative homology of the surface with non-trivial coefficients. Could, for example, be coefficients in a local system or more generally homology with coefficients in a perverse Schober. And so that's going to be the Fukaya category with coefficients. How does it work? Well, once you now have this notion of a perverse Schober, it's actually fairly straightforward. I mean, that's also more or less how it's defined, how it's sort of designed. This is what you want to do eventually. You choose a spanning graph um, of the surface, just like you would do in the other computation. So for example, if it's trivalent, then that would correspond to choosing a triangulation of the surface. But of course, to understand um, to understand the, the sort of partner moves, I also should allow some higher valencies, such as, for example, this ribbon graph. <clears throat> now, there's a new datum, just like in the usual situation, which is stops. I can specify some stops on the boundary of this Riemann surface. And then there's supposed to be an, um, an half one um, external half edge ending in the complement of, uh, so in each interval between two stops, there's one external half edge. Additional requirement is that every special point has to be, there has to be a vertex on it. And that's the kind of conditions which we want so that, you know, the spanning graph is a deformation retract of the surface um, somehow relative to the boundary. So let's put it like that. Now we have a perverse Schober. And we would now like to think of it as a coefficient system for computing a certain kind of homology. You know, so just like the other computation, it's you know it's some kind of a version of of um, uh, of factorization homology, if you want, for these disks um, moving around here. And so, how does it go? Just like the other co-limit diagram, I would put at this vertex here a copy of the a, a um, three quiver, I guess, in this case. Then I would have the A1 quiver here, and then there would be a co-limit which sort of identifies various objects, and then that's what gives me the um, absolute Fukaya category of the surface. Now we're doing exactly the same thing, and the diagram over which we take the co-limit is produced for us, is kept, is contained in um, this Imperbus um, Schober F, okay? And so what we really do to somehow get the correct invariance that we're interested in, we, you know, so, just like perverse sheaves, I can think of them as sheaves or co-sheaves. Um, here, I think of the Schober as a co-Schober, so I actually um, apply the duality before I compute this co-limit, okay? And there's a theorem which is basically, which is just based on a topological, interesting topological result, which is a contractibility of the space of all these um, um, ribbon graphs which now are required to um, run through the through the special points. So it's a new theorem. You have to prove contractibility of a certain space, um, which has as cells precisely. So the cells are precisely parameterized by these embedded um, based graphs based at these um, special points. Um, and that then means, you know, because you can then sort of contract um, these graphs just like you do in the other story. Contraction of the graph um, leads to an equivalence between the um, corresponding co-limits, and that shows you that this is actually a, a coherently independent um, invariant of the surface, only depending on x in the stops and the previous shoulder. Okay. Okay. So what can you compute with this? So that's the example as promised an application to cluster categories of surface, and everything I'm going to say from now on is is uh, is due to the work of Merlin Christ who's here, by the way, so you can uh, bother him with questions uh, later on. So, okay, so um, so here's 
just maybe the simplest situation, I take a disk with a bunch of special points and we'd like to produce some interesting privileged Schober on it. So how do we do it? We specify it locally. So there's a spherical adjunction that determines it. Um, it looks like um, so. So I have what are called infinity local systems on the two sphere. So I just write lock S2. You know, so alter, so maybe algebraically, if you want, these are these can be described as perfect modules over the DGA of chains on the on the on, on the base loop space of S2. As I said, I can think of them as infinity um, local systems. That's maybe that's uh, most nicely understood with um, coherent diagrams in the infinity categorical context, which is the second interpretation here. Then there's a Fukaya interpretation due to Abu Zaid. It's the wrapped Fukaya category of the cotangent bundle of the two sphere. And then in the end, there's a direct algebraic description. It's just perfect modules over a polynomial ring where S is sitting in degree one. Again, okay, so what is this um, S in degree one? Um, I have a local system of this two sphere. So I take a stock somewhere. That, that means I have a complex. And now I take the identity loop on that stock. And now you can sort of slide this identity loop once across um, the two sphere. That gives me a self homotopy of the identity. And that's precisely what this guy S here um, captures. Anyway, so now I glue these pieces. So I use the same spherical um, adjunction for all the singularities and I glue them together. So that gives me a privilege over. And now we'd like to compute. Okay, so now what should we get? So here, I'm just gonna compute two examples and then maybe that's um, hopefully gonna convince you that uh, something interesting um, happens. And then I'm gonna state uh, Merlin's uh, theorem in this context. So here's the first example, just two special points. Okay, so how does the corresponding pushout look like? Um, well, I choose this graph here, for example, and then the co-limit looks like this. It's gonna be local systems on S2. Now this factor to local systems on the point is just taking homology of the local system. And I have to compute the pushout. So how do I do that? There's several ways to do it. Um, let's just do the most um, hands-on one. Um, so model theoretic calculation in DGCAP. So that's what we're doing now. We're now computing a homotopy co-limit in the model structure on DGCAT, which was introduced by Tabuada, okay? Or maybe like a Morita um, modification of it. So how do we do this? Well, it's very explicit question. We have these small DG categories. We, they have a single object and endomorphisms um, KS, in this case, K here and K here. We have to compute the homotopy pushout. So we choose a co replacement. It's very easy to do, especially so these morphisms here are actually um, pushouts along generating co-fibrations in the Tabuada model structure. So it's you know it's it's uh, it's clear that they do the job. So I'm adjoining for for the self homotopy. I'm adjoining two variables t1 and t2 of one degree higher, which kill the self homotopy. Okay, but if I adjoin two um, variables that kill the same self homotopy, then I can take their difference, and that gives me a cycle. So that's K of T, where T is now one degree higher. And so I'm running a little out of time, so I'm speeding up a bit. So, um, so this computation tells me that the result of this computation is I get the Ginsburg DGA of the quiver A1. It's just this polynomial algebra with T in degree two and DT is equal to zero, which also I can think of as local systems on the three sphere, which I could have kind of guessed initially because the functor lock actually commutes with pushouts and the pushout of S2 over point is just a suspension and suspending the two sphere get the three sphere. Also, it therefore then has the Fukai interpretation. It's the wrapped Fukai category of the cotangent bundle of S3. Okay, so far so good. Um, now, a little more interesting, three singular points, three special points. Okay, now the diagram already looks um, quite a bit more complicated. Here at the central place here, I have a tensor product of the A2 quiver and local systems in S2. And then I have to compute this push out, which means essentially there's gonna be three of these self homotopies of the identity of three objects. And I somehow have to kill them. I have to cap them off by adjoining new variables. So let's do this computation very quickly. You can read it um, maybe more carefully later in the notes. So here's how it looks like. I have sort of the universal arrow A2 mapping from X to Y with a map called alpha. I have the self homotopy SX, self homotopy SY, and then there's a self homotopy of the cone, which is of course, uh, you know, which is of course um, determined by these two self homotopies and that's given by this matrix. And the cone of course also depends on X and Y in the map 
because the differential is somehow has this form. Essentially, what I'm doing here now is a computation with twisted complexes, just somehow very quickly and very um, sort of dirty. Now I'm adjoining three um, elements in degree two, sort of endomorphisms in degree two to each of these objects, x, y, and the cone, which kill the respective self homotopies. That's exactly what this co-limit tells me to compute. So what happens? Okay, I get a condition. Namely, let's write down a formula for the self homotopy of the cone that must be given in the form of a matrix, two by two matrix. And um, now there's a condition that its differential has to kill the self homotopy on the cone. So you start computing. Okay, so here's the differential, blah, blah, blah. You compute, you compute. I just want to show you that this is not just some abstract nonsense, but you can compute. Okay, so, so here you compute. And um, what do you extract out of all this, uh, all these formulas in the end? Okay, so um, there's going to be, let me just tell you the answer. It's going to be the Ginsburg DGA of the quiver A2. So there's going to be this T1 guy here, which you obtain by modifying this matrix entry T11. There's going to be this T2 guy here, which you obtain by modifying this entry. Then the most interesting part is maybe this T21 in the lower corner here. That's a new cycle. That's going to give you this map alpha star. Um, this guy, T12, it kills some relation. It kills uh, some unnecessary cycle, which I don't like, because otherwise I wouldn't get the Ginsburg DGA. And um, then there's these other relations, which I have, that the differential applied to these TIs are precisely giving me the relations that I know and love from the um, cluster story. Um, so there's a gen. So now I, I'm going to conclude in like a, one minute, maybe or so. So this generalizes for any marked surface without internal points. Um, you can produce such a perverse Schober um, such that um, the homology with coefficients um, computes um, the category of perfect modules of the corresponding Ginsburg DGA with respect to some chosen triangulation. Um, maybe a comment on the relation to symplectic geometry. So Ivan Smith showed um, a version of the statement, but not for the perfect um, modules, but for the locally perfect, pseudo-perfect modules. So he constructed an embedding of representations of, of locally perfect representations of the Ginsburg um, algebra into the Foucault category of a certain three color Biao that comes, you know, comes with the left shift's vibration on over the surface X. And so now this is maybe the sort of philosophical conclusion here. Um, this construction of computing this homology, it should be inter interpreted as an, a purely algebraic incarnation of a wrapped version of an algorithm due to Paul Seidel to compute the Foucault category in the case when you're given such a vibration in terms of the Foucault category of a regular, um, of a regular fiber plus some combinatorial vanishing thimble data, which in his situation is captured by what is called the Foucault Seidel category. So all of that data, you should imagine, is captured by this perverse Schober F. And computing the homology is basically performing Seidel's sort of one step of Seidel's algorithm to compute the Foucault category of the total space in terms of this data, but now in a wrapped version. So you so so therefore you don't just get locally perfect representations, but you really get perfect modules. Um, there's some advantages which this approach has. Um, for example, you understand the gluing of these Ginsburg DGAs because you have a natural notion of Ginsburg DGAs with boundary. You know, so for example, if you try to compute this guy here, you can just slice it. But the gluing pieces are now not Ginsburg DGAs themselves, but they have these external edges, which you have to take into account. And so using these external edges, you can then glue them back together. Okay, and then there's many, many things you can do. You can understand the Calabiyawa structures on these guys. Um, in terms of you know gluing of relative Calabiao structures and all, all these kind of things, which we um, know how to do for the usual Foucault categories, you can also apply in this context. And um, so um, th th there's hopefully going to be some more interesting statements um, you can derive in this context. Thanks very much for the intention. And uh, sorry, I, I went uh, brutally over time, so I apologize. So let's thank uh, Tobias for the nice talk. Maybe we have time for some quick questions. I saw there was one question in the chat. Oh, no. There was one question in the chat. If you...
Uh, has the has this axiomatic redefinition of Schober's appeared? No, it hasn't appeared in print yet. So we have several we have several drafts um, that are close to completion, and so but. You know, the, the problem was somehow that we had several um, iterations of definitions and we were always unhappy to the extent that we just, I don't know, we, we just didn't want to put this out because it was sort of, you know, you know, in one situation you somehow um, couldn't provide, uh, couldn't sort of write down examples. In the other situations you then couldn't do any computations and so it was sort of always rather dissatisfying. In fact, you know, even the first um, the description of perverse sheaves, it shared these deficiencies. Um, and sort of, I think that the right um, thing to do now is based on this paracyclic, um, the notion of this paracyclic category. And that uh, is what we're now sort of um, using. And so, yeah, so this, so it's a, it's a, it's a few drafts, um, which will, which will appear soon. I promise. Yes, uh, so maybe we will then take a break for three or four minutes, but let's thank Tobias again for that.